And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Exploring the Viking World with yours truly, CJ Adrian, and my co-host, blacksmithing guy who looks like a Viking but isn't, Taylor Mo. Thanks for having welcome me back, back as usual. Thanks for joining me again. Yeah, great to be back. Great to be back. Well, I have a question for you, Christoph. I am a blacksmith, as you said, and I'm currently working on a helmet right now. This is what I interpret to be a Viking inspired helmet. It is a Spangen helm made of multiple parts. It's got the cool cross really nice. guard. Thank you. It's coming along. Um, but I was kind of curious what you knew about authentic helmets. Um, you know, I know you're a big fan of horns on helmets, so I should probably ask you what size horns I should put on this thing. Don't you think huge fan? Yeah, <laughs> the bigger, the better. <laughs> Texas Longhorns. That's perfect. There we go. I think that's as accurate be, as any horn. It should be like a Viking drinking horn hat, like one of those ones that you have at like sports games and stuff like that. So two horns full of mead with a little straw down to my. my well, mouth. I've been arguing that for a while, right? Like because <laughs> yeah. they they did drink mead out of horns. It's called a sond, S J A U N D, uh-huh. and they would so th- so you would drink out of a horn. So when you put horns on the helmet, it's just a beer helm. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's all. He's not a be. serious warrior. <laughs> There's Spain again. He just came to watch. <laughs> he just came to watch. He's got the he's got the pennant and the flag of our king, and he's gonna root for us. He knows the wave. It's all you know, good. <laughs> <laughs> he's our cheerleader. He's he wears perfume and stuff like that. He's not a fighter. <laughs> yeah. The uh, we, I think we talked about this with Rainer Oskarsson and William Short a little bit. I was trying mm-hmm. to poke them a little bit with this controversy over helms, mm-hmm. helmets, mm-hmm. helms call them whatever you want yeah uh because in the viking age we have very little evidence for them even being a thing right mm-hmm. we have tons of swords we even have chain mail mm-hmm. we even have like pieces of lamellar which is kind of controversial oh we have very few helmets interesting and actually where the the area of france that i study so uh-huh. it's the Brittany region of france southern Brittany. there's a carving uh or like a basically a a, a, a pictorial of uh, in a document called the life of saint aubin and it shows the Vikings, uh, evidently there was a miracle. This, this Saint Aubin came and helped the Bretons fight off the Vikings. And the Vikings are all represented as having helmets and chain mail and spears okay. and all that. Now, we know that they didn't have any or wouldn't have had much uniformity across their entire war band, right, in terms of arms and armor. But it's curious that the author decided to give everybody helmets, Hmm. And uh, helmets were an important thing in combat back then because, well, you've got to protect your head. Yeah. But the fact that we have so few in the histo- the archaeological record leads to the question, you know, number one, why, if they were widely worn, or it opens the door to were they worn ubiquitously at all by the Vikings? Hmm. Or did the History Channel accidentally get it right? <laughs> right? Don't give him a helmet. He's our star. We have to recognize him. But then inadvertently, it's like, oh, but then Nobody the real Viking heroes didn't wear helmets. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I, hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, so that source you're referring to, um, would we would we call that probably our best, like, I don't know, historical account that would point towards helmets or you know there are what, other representations mm-hmm. of them wearing helmets uh particularly there's uh there, there's uh picture stones in scandinavia where mm-hmm. they show them with helmets so that's a good indication that helmets were worn mm-hmm. at least by the wealthier better equipped people in a war band for example mm-hmm. so if you were if you were attached to a king if you were part of his herd which is his immediate entourage you know, his, his, his closest mm-hmm. warriors he would have the king would have spent money to help equip you and that would have included uh, all kinds of weapons armor anything they would pick off of the enemy or scandinavia had very well-trained blacksmiths so they could commission the forging of special weapons for you special armor mm-hmm. etc yeah i mean it makes sense the king i mean if you're gonna establish a guard to take care of yourself and you're responsible for funding them you're going to want them to have the best protection possible because they're your protection i mean and yeah they're your guys yeah, right? there's, there's no there was never really a standing army in viking kingdoms per se it's more just like hey we're going raiding grab your gear let's go and it was this hodgepodge of you know anything from linen tunics to full chainmail hauberks and stuff like that and um you know there's no there's no set uniform armor like we see in the like 14th 15th and 16th centuries where those start popping up but it makes sense that maybe the 
better equipped and better financed warriors would have something well especially early on mm -hmm. in the viking age because remember it's three centuries right so yeah. over three centuries you have a lot that happened mm -hmm. and styles of arms and armor even clothing hairstyles etc they all changed over time mm -hmm. right we get different hairstyles every two three years <laughs> You look at, well, I actually, we'll call it decades, right? Like, because the 80s are infamous for, like, the, <laughs> Very the really, true. and then the 70s had their own hairdo, the 60s, mm -hmm. 90s were the worst. Mm. <laughs> and they're Debatable. back. Debatable. Uh, but, <laughs> I'm just picturing a Viking in the 80s. That's what I'm picturing right now, like. A Viking, yeah. <laughs> so the same thing back like then, you know, the styles changed over time. It's mm -hmm. fun because you can, you can look at um, picture stones from Scandinavia that are representing earlier Viking age people, and they'll have long long hair long beards uh and then later in the viking age like there's uh a coin that was minted in jorvik which is now york mm -hmm. and it was a controlled by the viking a town controlled by the vikings mm -hmm. for quite a while and the king's fane was his fane fork beard yeah and he had a he had it minted uh, or coin minted and he had he had shaved his face and cut his hair to be more like the saxons Interesting. Uh, there's an expression at the time called shave like a Frank, you know, because the, the Carolingians were all about, you know, shaving off their beards and having uh -huh. their hair cut short at that time. That, but that's much later in the Viking age. Yeah. Closer to the, the high medieval period. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Because earlier on, everybody was a barbarian. The, Car the Carolingians were barbarians, right? Yeah. Charlemagne had the long beard and the long hair and everything. And it wasn't until, you know, 200 years later that the, the style changed and they started shaving and, you know. Yeah. They're trying to look more Roman. That makes sense. Kind of smarten up and clean right. themselves up. Well, okay, think so of the Carolingians. They, they started calling themselves the Holy Roman Empire. Yes, exactly. We, it, uh, we, it was not lost. They were trying to be Roman. Yeah. They were basically <laughs> or the next to Rome. back. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, you have a helmet there behind you. I do. I have um, a replica. Yeah. Tell me about that one. Uh, so it's a, a replica. Here, I'll grab it. Yeah, grab it. I don't really want to grab. I'm just going to point to it. Okay. Um, cause it's kind of oil and it's got the chain mail on the back. Uh, so a lot of this is conjecture how they made this, you know, mm -hmm. I bought it from a site that claims to have historically accurate replicas. Mm -hmm. It's based off of the Gjörbundu helmet, which was found in Norway. It's the only <laughs> it's helmet found in Norway. <laughs> uh, it was found in a farm and it was found in a couple of pieces. So uh -huh. the archeologists tried to put a piece back together, but they didn't have all of it. Mm -hmm. So, of course, when they created the model like the replica, they filled in the blanks. So there's a Got certain it. margin of error. Mm -hmm. And this is the best, as close as we think we can get. Okay. Uh, but it, it tends to match the pictorial evidence we have at the time as well. So it's kind of a, it's, it's our best example of what a helmet might have looked like during the Viking mm -hmm. Age. And why none of them, except for one, survived. Mm -hmm. It's still a mystery. It's one of the great mysteries of the Viking Age. Mm. Where'd the helmets go? What's your theory? Ooh, I'm kind of caught between the two arguments. Mm -hmm. I find that the argument for helmets were ubiquitous, but then the type of metal used to make them was easier to repurpose than say a, a sword. Mm -hmm. uh, and then perhaps helmets were not. So when you, we don't have any helmets in the burials of like chieftains. Mm -hmm. So they're in their boats. So they have their boats, they have their horses, they have their slaves, they have their animals, they have their gold, they have their swords and other armor, but no helmets. So huh. maybe helmets just weren't a valued type of, of armor culturally. For some reason, we don't know. Okay. The other option is just they were expensive to make and yeah. easy to destroy. Mm -hmm. So that maybe, maybe they didn't wear them. Although it'd be odd because everybody else did. Yeah. And it's I mean, imprudent if, to go into battle without a helmet. Isn't there something... Um, well, you know, when I think about how these are made, at least how this one was, is, you know, it's a lot of flat, triangular plates of metal that have been bowled out into this dome. Um, I can see that being a really useful shape to repurpose if you broke it apart, because it's just riveted. You can punch out rivets without any real issue so if you were to disassemble this into its actual parts you have strips of metal and you have these triangular dished shapes of metal and i can see that being super useful i mean a strip that goes over the top or across the side here i could see that being used to you know 
repair a barrel or uh, a cartwheel or, you know, reinforce a, a spear haft on, on the pole and that, and that kind of stuff. So I feel like there's a lot to be said for the repurposing argument. Well, and, and so I don't have any expertise in metalworking, but you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're a blacksmith, so you know, you, you would know what would be feasible. Yeah. In yeah, terms yeah. of pulling that thing apart. Well, and, you know, when you think about it, like, you know, as a modern smith, I get to go to the steel yard and order a sheet of steel perfectly thick exactly where I want it. And then I get to work it from there. But back then it was smelted and then drawn out. So every piece of sheet steel that we would use in the modern world like this had to have been hand beaten and flattened out until it was the right size. So it's a lot of effort to make plate too. So that kind of also maybe lends itself to your argument about it was expensive and time consuming to make because yeah, I mean, a bar of steel, you could argue is easier to make than a plate of steel, meaning a sword would in theory be easier to forge out from raw stock than, you know, something this thin and sophisticated. On the other hand, thin metal isn't a lot of metal, so it's easier to get a bigger surface area out of less ore and stock that goes into it. So I don't know, it's, it's, there's kind of two sides to that you could argue. And then you said it's, thin metal which mm -hmm. wouldn't hold up over time as well right like you have a, a sword that's it's, it's made of thick steel meant yeah. to last for a while and even those when we when, when we pull them out of the ground or archaeologists will pull them out of the ground and they'll be significantly decayed mm -hmm. right so you think about that happening to a sword and then you take say a, a helmet that's just made out of iron they wouldn't make it out of steel at that point because exactly. they'd just be prohibitively expensive and, and just iron's not going to last as long. So maybe well, we have found more helmets. They're just, they're more decomposed than the other things that we're finding. Yeah. So, I mean, to put it into perspective, um, a typical sword is, oh, I'd say you could, I'd say a typical Viking sword from that period, based on the research I've done, which is from a bunch of gravesite ones, uh, they they're at their thickest point, they're between a quarter inch or six millimeters or so in thickness. Whereas that, um, that's the one I'm building is 16 gauge steel, which is about a 16th of an inch. And that's considered heavy for, uh, traditional armor, at least according to, uh, I did some time in the SCA organization. Then they said that was the big, the big fallacy of armor from the early medieval ages is people think it's really thick stuff, but really it was super thin. So it might be more accurate to say a helmet would have been like 18 gauge steel. And so that's less than a 16th of an inch in thickness. And yeah, you're right. If it's iron, um, it could just rust like that and just it not leave nothing left to it. So we could think it's simply an arm band, but really it's just the, you know, the headband part of a helmet and everything else is falling away. I mean, your helmet did, was, did your helmet come rusted or is that just, how it happened over time. That's how they made it okay. to make it look cool. Okay. I was going to say, cause I'm like, if you bought that thing new, that means that thing rusted pretty quick. So you could see yeah, how no, it's, it could go. it's a fake. Like, <laughs> <stuff>. <laughs> well, and then, and then the, the hole in that argument too, would be, we have hundreds and hundreds of grave sites mm -hmm. of important people with their weapons and armor. And then even the wood of the ship is preserved. So, and those don't have helmets. That's true. So That's we're true. we're still missing. They're still conspicuously absent in certain areas. So it just kind of drives forward the mystery. Like no one's cracked this egg yet, right? Like mm -hmm. it's is that an idiomatic expression we use in English? Crack an egg? Yeah, I think so. Okay, hopefully. I don't know. It's <laughs> idioms. I need a. I need a. I'm familiar with something. the phrase, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you grow up bilingual, idioms are like your worst enemy because you get them all. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, how about this for a theory? What about kind of ancestral handing down helmets? That's something I could see making more sense than like the honored sword that you need in the afterlife to go fight in Valhalla with, you know? Sure, but I feel like and those would have survived too. Yeah. Or should have. You know, like I said, we found Lamellar. Yeah, it's true. In Sweden. That's yeah, that super weird. Be... So they brought That's that all the so way bizarre. in from Byzantium. So well, it... Byzantium wasn't really a thing. The Eastern Roman Empire. Because <laughs> the, the argument I... Byzantium today. The argument I have for why it would make sense for them to have it is their fighting style is very much 
you know, shield oriented, the shield wall, the, right. you know, in armies like that. So if you have a big shield wall and, you know, based on the size of Viking shields, like especially like the ones behind you there, um, you're covering a good chunk of the torso. So you don't necessarily need as much armor if your shield's doing that work for you, but what's exposed above the shield is the head. The head. And, you know, if some other ax is coming down, you know, a lot of downward strokes, which are the fighting style of that time, the helmet's perfect to catch that and ding it off. So it, it, so it makes like sense for them to enough. have it. Yeah, they'd be smart enough to figure that out eventually, I'd figure, I'd think. It'd take a few cracked skulls to be like, you yeah, know, exactly. I feel like we're missing something out of uh, our, our kit. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, oh, I, I know I was called thick headed, but it's not uh, not good enough for this. But early in the Viking Age, like first raid, say late 8th century, um, early 9th century, they wouldn't have been very well equipped. They were just farmers and they would have carried weapons with them that would have been from the farm. So maybe like a wood splitting axe or, um, uh, you know, even maybe like a, not a scythe, but like, what's that thing where they knock down wheat, you know? Like oh, those, yeah. It's, yeah. Those, it's yeah. Like- spears. Spears would have been number one. Their okay. number one weapon it gives you distance it's it's just a no-brainer like everybody's got spears knife and then they would have you know maybe <laughs> a hunting knife or something to to back it up mm-hmm. and then you know they you wouldn't have been able to afford they didn't have plate armor chain mail would have been prohibitively expensive so you would have mm-hmm. had either tightly woven linen or just really thick wool mm-hmm. so the first vikings maybe didn't have helmets fair it's too expensive mm-hmm. we, we could call it pre pre-helmet viking age <laughs> <laughs> and the helmets only came in later uh-huh right well and, and just like at the beginning like i said they're they're mostly farmers and you know not not a professional army mm-hmm. but the warrior culture developed over time and we see that with the yoms vikings in particular where they created a, a warrior fraternity if you will right mm-hmm. as a warrior society and you had to be inducted and initiated uh we have tons of sagas about it so the, the, the character and style of warfare for Viking Age Scandinavians changed over time. Mm-hmm. So it could just be 200 out of 300 years of the Viking Age, no one wore a helmet. And then when they did start wearing them, it could be a, a mix of everything else that we talked about. Repurposing. Um, I think that's the big one, right? Repurposing. <laughs> I think so, yeah. The K, okay, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, the Dark Ages that precede the Viking Age aren't known for a lot of armor and, you know, skilled craftsmanship in that regard. So it wouldn't surprise me if as a society evolves like the Viking societies did, it took them a while to get to that point. I mean, we, you know, and who's to say that they weren't the reason that other medieval civilizations got a quicker jump on it because they saw what the Vikings were doing or, you know, were responding to it. And, you know, I mean, there's no reason to suggest that the Vikings couldn't have gone two centuries of just saying, yeah, it's good enough. Let's go. We're just, you know, we're not trying to be a standing army. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of some of the bigger, what we would think of as Viking battles and like warfare was later in the Viking era. The first probably a few centuries was mostly just like pillage, 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 you know, little raid here, raid there, not like big standing armies and kings assembling war bands and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a historian out of France named Lucien Mm Musset, and he proposed the three phases of Viking expansion. Mm -hmm. In particular, he used the experience of France in the Viking Age to put that together. But the phase one was the sporadic raids. They show up, they grab stuff, they leave. The second phase is once the coastal settlements that were accessible early in the Viking Age became bankrupt because they kept getting raided, uh, then the Vikings moved in and used their their reputation to convince local lords or local chieftains whatnot to pay them off, the Danegeld, mm, right? Okay. And actually, the Danegeld was coined after it was successfully done in the region of Brittany in France, long before it was ever done in England. Uh, and so that that second phase is where essentially you show up and you say, I, I you know, I'm going to raid you now, or you can just pay me seven thousand pounds of silver and I'll leave. Hmm. 
And then they it's came just, back it's, for a it's while. Such a, and they kept it's doing such a mob it. heist. It's like it's like it's an old mafia. A, yeah, it's be a shame if someone came and uh, raided you. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a real shame if that uh, wall you just built was somehow caught on fire or something. <laughs> and so they, uh, yeah. So so then they did that for a while, and then once those petty kingdoms or petty chi- uh, chi- uh, or the small. Uh, they're not fiefs yet, but they, Mm -hmm. but anyway, once the territory becomes bankrupt, then we start seeing the, the wider invasion attempts. And those invasion attempts had the purpose of not necessarily occupying, although that did happen in certain areas, Mm -hmm. but to remove the government of the local area Mm -hmm. and replace it with a puppet government that beholden to the Vikings who would then set up the entire economy to funnel the wealth over time up to the top and then out to the Vikings. Ah, oh, okay. That so that's the sense. third phase. And that's where you see the great heathen army, the mm-hmm. great heathen army before the great heathen army that we talked about. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then nice, in Ireland, nice plug. <laughs> big efforts to do that. Uh, and then out East the Rus. So you have the invitation, of the Rus, you have uh, Rurik and his two brothers who go out East and start actually ruling over those territories, not mm-hmm. because they were, they wanted to rule over the Slavs. It's all about money. Okay. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, so based on that, then I can see exactly why there might not have been a need or thought process to even say I need a helmet to go raid. Like, if you're all about like get in, get out, you know, you know, like guerrilla attacking, you don't need to come in like a tank. You just need to come in and be stronger than the peasants that you're preying on you know you're not they're not targeting soldiers they're targeting peasants so why do you need to overly protect yourself against peasants right and at at that time the armor was heavy like once you get to like the 13th or 14th centuries a knight was very mobile because the 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 technology had gotten so far that then they could run around and and be completely flexible and everything was jointed the metal was lighter and thinner but stronger Uh, i i'll pick you up on one point which is yes they were more mobile it wasn't that much lighter, I'll tell you that, oh, well, from, hey, from having yeah, worn the it, real it, stuff. If you're a Viking, <laughs> you're trying to show up, you're not going to be in, you know, 150 yeah, pounds of equipment. You know? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that stuff's really heavy. Uh, <laughs> but well, what's interesting, too, is there's a there's a grave site that was found on the island of Goa off the coast of Brittany. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that really survived was the shield bosses. Interesting. And one of the things that those shield bosses have that's different from all the rest Mm -hmm. is that they were custom designed. Oh, the new design had a little bit, a little bit different of a, it was like they made it into like a five point star almost. Mm -hmm. And the thought behind it is they were trying to reinforce their shields specifically to fight against the Bretons who use javelins like the Romans. Oh, interesting. Because the javelin, basically what a javelin does is it has a very soft tip. And so it hits your shield and it bends. Mm -hmm. So then it, it takes out your shield and then they take you down with arrows. Yeah, exactly. Right. So they they were they were customizing their arms and armor per the area that that they were trying to you know become rich in. That's clever. Yeah, that's really clever. I wonder wonder how often they did that. I mean, it would kind of make sense. You know, we were talking about this last week with um, their invasions of Spain and how Spain learned from the Viking invasions and became one of the first ones to be able to really punch back. Um, it clearly must have gone in reverse. You know, if you're raiding an area for, you know, repeated numbers of times and you start to see how they're fighting back against you, you're going to, you know, change your attack style, your, your arms and armor to, you know, work against that. So, yeah. And they were also astute at involving themselves in the local politics, like the Carolingian empire mm-hmm. in particular under Charlemagne, they couldn't get up river because he had fortified the river systems. But once the Carolingian empire split after his death, well, actually, that is actually during the life. Well, it was after his death and during the lifetime of his son Louis, mm-hmm. who then had an inheritance issue with his sons. But they let those river defenses fall apart, mm-hmm. and immediately afterwards, the Vikings were raiding up river, just blazing right through there. And then they started taking cities. Uh, right? Eight forty three Nantes, eight forty five Paris, mm-hmm. and so then they like- got cocky. In eight forty seven, they went to Seville and they got they got their butts kicked. <laughs> <laughs> That's always that's always the case, isn't it? It's yeah. they they get you always get too comfortable, and then suddenly that's we when went gonna get too you. far. <laughs> <laughs> One raid too many. <laughs> yeah, a raid too far. <laughs> Starring Sean Connery. Yeah, there we go. 
I'll oh, see you at the Guadalajara Cavia. <laughs> that sounded more like Patrick Stewart. <laughs> Just a little bit. It was, there, was, there was kind of a fine line between the two. Can you imagine a Sean Connery played Viking? Like, that would be insane. Didn't he, though? Wait. Did he? I don't remember. He played King Arthur. Yeah. And then he played a dragon. Yeah, uh-huh. It's the dragon's heart. <laughs> that was bad. But anyway, whatever. Who cares? No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> No, I know, who was it? It was. You're um, not supposed to do Sean Connery's voice well. Like no one is. That's not, no. It's, that's yeah. the point. It's a caricature. It's a joke. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, who was it? It was. Uh, what was that Viking movie from the 50s, like 1958? It was uh, one of the Duvals, right? Yeah. Um, I can't remember. It's, it's been okay. a long time since I've seen that one. Well, speaking of like horrible representations, let's bring this thing full circle to yes. your idea of putting. Horns on your helmet. <laughs> I think we t- said we'd talk about it last time. Yeah. And so I'm going to share my screen real quick. I, I do want to just preface for all the you know actual knowledgeable Viking fans we have here. I was kidding about doing horns. <laughs> I would rather burn the helmet than put horns on it. But I feel like I have to give Kristoff some, some <laughs> ribbing here and there. <laughs> Uh, so here we go. 1876 costume designs by Carl Emil Doppler, quote, the elder, end quote. So this was a Berlin opera, uh, une mise en scène of Richard Wagner's Der Ring des Nibelung, Der Lungen. I don't know. I don't speak German. Anyway, so here's, these are actually drawn from the actual pamphlet of all the costume designs. Okay. This website's kind of fun. Um, they put all these up, so I assume this is all public dom- public domain. We'll see. <laughs> I think it's fine. But anyway, you can see all the costume designs. It's about Germanic myth- mythology, so you have uh-huh. all the different gods. You have the Valkyries, all very famous, right? And then they yeah. have some real da da da. And now I actually have on my computer a picture. Let's see, I'm going to stop sharing here. I have the one with the horns. Oh. But I'm going to have to do a little bit of... So for those of you who are just listening, we are looking at pictures of all the costume designs from that 1876 mise-en-scene of um, Richard Wagner's opera. Mm -hmm. And we'll put a link to this um, so you can take a look at it, I'm sure. Well, actually, what I'll do, I'm going to publish this on my website, so then I'll just put the picture on there. Because there's one picture in particular. Mm -hmm. That we're going to look at it's just i have so many windows open here we go uh share screen there it is share boom you see that yep mm-hmm. so what we're seeing is uh the gentleman has a spear a little round shield i think this made out of bronze so you can tell they were just really making it up <laughs> <laughs> the thinnest of thin mustaches the thinnest of thin mustaches He's got kind of like 1970s, like down to your neck hair. Yep. Um, is, that, is that supposed to be like the, the like the Roman like muscle chest piece kind of a little bit? Like there's, or is he just not like that? Or is he just not? Is that like a sheer black top? Because it looks like there's like a belly button there. <laughs> or maybe he's just hairy. I mean, if you look really oh, close, whoa. yeah, that's just a- <laughs> <laughs> it's just fur. It's just fur. <laughs> he's a real heathen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and then there you have the helmet with the horns mm-hmm. on it. And that's it. That's where it all came from. It's just this one piece of costume design. Then, yes. Uh, they wanted him to make look a little bit like a devil, right? Yeah. Like makes barbarians. Sense. If you want, if you want your characters to be the heathens, make them look like demons. That's the easiest way to do it in storytelling. Yeah. There you go. And that's huh. it. There's nothing glorious about it, but for some reason we all, just, we all we all just uh, well yeah and then i blame looney tunes when they started doing their opera stuff yeah well because they <laughs> well they mimicked it exactly they did a really good job no they did a fantastic <laughs> don't get me wrong i'm just i'm giving i'm just giving some crap to looney tunes because i got it but <laughs> it's still probably one of the best looney tunes episode ever actually <laughs> yeah well yeah and then they had the music and yeah it was entertaining for children exactly <laughs> but not a historical resource people do not use Looney Tunes for your history. No. <laughs> <laughs> of 
Great. Well, I, I think uh, that that's a wrap for today. I would like to yeah. remind everyone, if you do enjoy our short discussions here, and we are going to have a couple of guests coming up, I'll put a guest list up on Patreon. Uh, but go ahead and hit subscribe like, to this comment, video. All the good stuff. That way you can see everything that comes out. We're going to have a guest uh, coming up soon who's going to talk to us about the Vikings and Ekiten. And also, mm-hmm. if you really enjoy these podcasts, uh, join us on Patreon. We're going to have some exclusive live Q&As. It's going to be with myself and Mr. Mo, man who looks like a Viking, but, but isn't, isn't. <laughs> uh, and, and podcast guests. So that's a great place to get some exclusive content and um, get up and personal with us. You can even ask us some weird questions, ask hopefully Taylor some blacksmithing questions and me some Viking history questions Yep, and not the other way around. <laughs> I mean, it'd be really funny to try it the other way around. You'll probably get completely inaccurate answers, but we'll try our best. <laughs> we will speak with confidence. <laughs> exactly. We speak loud. That's how pe- we make people think we're right. <laughs> yeah. What was it? I, somebody told me the other day, they're like, I, I'm not going to question what you're saying because you, you say it with such confidence. <laughs> but I don't know if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you, but the way you said it makes me believe you. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. It's just being confident in what you're saying is half the battle. That's exactly. how some people become president. Uh-huh. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> With that, awkward silence. Out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone.